For those at home, this is a, a formal ceremony that has been done across the United States many, many times by the World War II um, Memorial Committee. And um, they've been working with Sandy. I want to thank her publicly for all the work she's done coordinating with them um, the, the evening. Chairman Harrington, the Massachusetts National World War II Memorial Commission requests permission to enter. Mr. Dean of the Massachusetts House of Representatives, please enter. of the Foxborough Board of Selectmen. As the chairman of the Massachusetts World War II Memorial Committee, I bid you greetings from the committee and also greatly appreciate the valuable time on your calendar so that we can lay aside this evening an evening to honor Mrs. Myrick Hyrett Craft. I would like now to introduce the honorary chairman of our committee, Captain Tom Hudner who has some brief opening remarks. Captain Hudner. Thank you. Please be seated, board. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and the honorable members of the Board of Selectmen, on behalf of the Massachusetts World War II Memorial Committee, I want to thank you for the opportunity <laughs> this evening to honor a truly great citizen. This is Myra Kraft. It is traditional for our committee to honor those who have made great contributions to preserve our American way of life. Through her charitable work on the home front of Massachusetts, Myra Kraft went far beyond the call of duty in an unprecedented effort to help those less fortunate. It is worthy for all of us to come out of our homes on a cold New England evening to pay our due respects to Mrs. Myra Kraft. Chairman Harrington, I present our proclamation chairman, Sheriff Peter Flynn, former president of the Massachusetts Sheriff's Association. Thank you very much, Mr. Hudner and Mr. Kraft, family members, Mr. Harrington, the members of your board, citizens that are gathered here tonight, it's uh, my privilege to serve as chairman of the Proclamation Committee. Whereas the Massachusetts National World War II Memorial Committee, under its duty prescribed by its chairman emeritus, the Honorable John Joseph Moakley, to promote patriotism in our communities and recognize those who have gone before us, who preserved our American way of life, Hence, after a thorough analysis of contributions to our communities, we determined Mrs. Myra Hyatt Kraft, a national role model for American women, for her tireless giving through charitable works. Pat Lawton, former chairman of the county commissioners in Plymouth County, what say ye of Myra Kraft? Whereas Myra Hyatt, as her father's daughter witnessed firsthand during her childhood in Worcester, Mass., one of the greatest examples of philanthropic giving in the history of the Commonwealth, 
by her father, Jacob Hyatt. Walter Parker of Foxborough, what do ye say about Myra Craft? I'm honored to be here tonight, and I'm having some voice problems, so my niece is going to do this. Thank you. Whereas Myra Hyatt endured childhood with the knowledge of losing her grandfather and grandmother in Lithuania, along with her great aunts and uncles due to the Nazi Holocaust, thus dedicating her life to a duty to remember the stories of the Holocaust and to teach tolerance in society. Georgia Hudner of Concord, what say ye of Myra Kraft? Whereas Myra Hyatt, raised in the philanthropic legacy of Jacob Hyatt, emulated her beloved father, and at age five, visiting the displaced and less fortunate in European camps, recognizing early in life the historical impact of the World War II camps. Roberta Parker of Foxborough, what say ye of Myra Kraft? Whereas Myra Hyde, daughter of one of the early visionary leaders of Brandeis University, journeyed to Israel in 1948 to assist the less fortunate at the dawn of the creation of Israel. Cindy Thorpe of Mansfield, what say ye of Myra Kraft? Whereas student Myra Hyatt Kraft, author of the play North Atlantic, which gave recognition to our coastal community that contributed to preserve our freedom in World War II. James Clinton of Mansfield, what say ye of Myra Kraft? Whereas the Jerusalem Post records that Myra Hyatt as a child went door to door raising money for the poor children of Palestine into the darkness of night at great concern to her mother, yet returning home with a sack of money for the children of Palestine. Kara Griffin of the Chamber of Commerce, what say ye about Myra Kraft? Whereas Myra Hyatt married Robert Kraft in June of 1963, and the union being blessed with four sons, Jonathan, Daniel, Josh, and David Kraft, making great contributions to the community life in Brookline, the local Tritown communities, and throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Bruce Roberts of Foxborough, what say ye of Myra Kraft? Whereas Myra Kraft personally staffed phone banks for fundraising drives for the less fortunate when they cause needed financial boost. Jack Othelette of Foxborough, the town historian, what say ye of Myra Kraft? Whereas Myra Hyatt Kraft, as a leader of charitable organizations, although petite and frame, had the courage of a lion in her quest to show by example the importance of reaching out to those in need and to teach tolerance in our society. Pam Goodman of Mansfield, what say ye of Myra Kraft? Whereas Myra Hyatt Kraft served on the board of Brandeis University for the Boston Foundation and the United Way of Massachusetts Bay, exhibiting a tireless effort to education in those in need. Sandy Clinton of Mansfield, what say ye of Myra Kraft? Whereas Myra Hyatt Kraft, the board of Brigham and Women's Hospital in the American Repertory Theater, giving tirelessly, tirelessly to medical care and the importance of art and theater to society. Bob Simon, chairman of the Foxborough Veterans, what say ye of Myra Kraft? Whereas Myra Hyatt Kraft, served on the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee facing history and ourselves, a Holocaust education organization, thus enhancing valuable knowledge of Jewish history. Greg DeSimon of Mansfield, what say ye of Myra Kraft? Whereas Myra hired Kraft as president of the Kraft Family Foundation and the New England Patriots Charitable Foundation, under her leadership, have given in unprecedented fashion to the needs of medical, educational, arts, educational organizations, along with youth sports, Catholic schools, and at-risk children. Jack Sullivan of Plymouth, what say ye of Myra Kraft? Whereas Cardinal Sean O'Malley of Boston declared Myra Hyatt Kraft a strong advocate for serving the less fortunate and a great supporter of Catholic charities, giving dedicated support and commitment to serve others in need. Tim Keneally of Foxborough, what say ye of Myra Kraft? Whereas Michael Durkin, 
CEO of United Way of Massachusetts Bay declared, through great vision, Maya Hyatt Craft insisted that nonprofits be the best and do the best. David Flynn, former Dean of the House, from Bridgewater, what say ye of Myra Craft? Whereas the Boston Globe has declared that Myra Hyatt Craft has forged a whole new form of engaged giving, and whereas the International Health Tribune declared that Myra Hyatt Craft has modeled a new form of engaged giving that is transforming the relationship between philanthropists and philanthropy. Kevin Weinfeld of Foxborough, what say ye of Myra Craft? Whereas the Jewish Community uh, Relations Council has declared that Myra Hyatt Craft has embodied the Jewish values of tzedakah and social justice through her charitable efforts on behalf of the Jewish community and the people of Greater Boston, further declaring that Myra Hyatt Craft is a woman of great <clears throat> integrity and passion who saw challenges as opportunities, making a difference in the lives of the people she met. Whereas the Massachusetts National World War II Memorial Committee, under the prescribed duty of its Chairman Emeritus, John Joseph Moakley, recognizes Myra Hyatt Kraft for her unprecedented leadership in our Commonwealth, thus hereby declare her a guardian to the Hall of Patriotic Heroes in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Therefore, be it resolved that the Massachusetts National World War II Memorial Committee hereby declares on behalf of the citizens of the state of Massachusetts recognizing Mrs. Myra Hyatt Craft as a national role model for women for all she has done in her tremendous contributions to assist the less fortunate through her legacy of charitable work. We submit this with great honor to the Foxborough Board of Selectmen on the 24th day of January in this year, 2012. This time I'd like to introduce a, a tireless worker. Uh, he was appointed by Congressman Mulkley as chairman of the World War II <coughs> Memorial Commission here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And he has carried out with great dignity and also lots of energy his responsibilities and duties. Ed Sullivan. <coughs> Good evening. And, um, Thank you for all turning out on a January night that is actually, we're blessed with a little balmy weather. It's January and it's cold to come out in Massachusetts. And Myra Craft is a worthy citizen for us to come together and come out in honor tonight. I just want to open and convey to Mr. Craft and members of the Craft family our deep condolences and great appreciation to be joining us. Um, it, I know it's difficult sometimes to endure through a lot of well-intentioned sentiments, but I would like to convey that um, we have our Commander-in-Chief down in Washington who tells all of us that we're going through a rough patch in this time period of our country. And great Americans like Myra Kraft are something fabric in the society that we can hold on to. So in essence, our committee is memorializing the memory of Myra Craft for our own self-interest so that we as a community can come together and have something to hold on to, a fabric that can help us get through that rough patch and get on to the business of our lives. Us, the survivors, we all have to move on and go and do our duty in life. And as citizens of Massachusetts, every one of us here are members of the Massachusetts World War II Memorial Committee. We are the purveyors of American history. It's our duty to recall those that have gone before us that have made great contributions to society. It's easy to lay at home on the couch and eat fudge and watch TV. It's not easy after work to come down here, pay respect to the Board of Selectmen for their time and their voluntary service, and come out and do our part it's our duty, our fiduciary duty, to come out. And I honor all of you for being here tonight. Now, you've heard from the citizens about some of the wonderful highlights of Myra Kraft's life and of what I've read as a historian with the National 
Maritime Union and the appointee by Joe Moakley to the committee. Um, I put together a storyboard to bring out not only the significance of Myra Kraft's contributions on the home front here, but also a historical analysis of others. Because of what we read about Myra Kraft is the fact that she's always given credit to others. She would always do and give, but she would always give credit to others. So instead of singularly on Myra, I think she would appreciate the fact that we we remember some of the other great Americans. So the committee's put together a storyboard on Myra Kraft, what we consider a hall of patriotic heroes, a short snippet. Some of the people me and Captain Hudner recognize are executive uh, committee members on our committee, the two end pieces. But I'd just like to briefly highlight and begin with Crispus Atticus, the true patriot. Crispus Atticus did something very, very special in Boston. And Peter, I need this prop. <laughs> now, I want to tell you as an historian, Crispus Atticus is here with a rifle. But the real truth down there in, by Boston Common was Crispus Atticus was a runaway slave, a fisherman. He was out in Western Mass, and he didn't like his slave holder to keep him during snowstorms chained up in the goat shed out behind the house. He was shivering every night. None of us would like that. So he ran away, and he went down there and tuck in and did some a whaling on the whaling ships. He shows up in Boston in a beautiful buckskin suit and his New England Patriot blue wool sweater to keep him warm. <laughs> and he's a little cantankerous, and he's saying down at by Faneuil Hall, everybody's barking about the British. And Crispus Atticus got up after a few drinks, and he tapped his big stick. And he says, do you want to fight? And everybody said, yeah, we want to fight. Well, let's give them a fight. So they marched down King Street, and Crispus Atticus led the way with all of that anger because he understood the British wanted to come over us, give us taxes, and do all these things. And he wanted to fight. He was tired of slavery. The very best patriots were the African Americans. They had nothing to lose. They wanted to fight. They were tired of being slaves. They finally get their freedom from slavery. And the British want to come in and encompass them and give them some more of slavery, you know. So he leads the fight down King Street, and we have the Boston Massacre. Crispus Atticus just marched right into them, and they shot him and killed him. So what did Sam Adams do? He says, get that man with a blue patriot sweater and the buckskin suit, and we're laying him out at Faneuil Hall. For four days, he laid there. The first New England Patriot laid there, and they put him out there for a purpose. So the British and everyone could see that we were going to fight. We were willing to die for our freedom. And this is where our New England Patriot tradition began. Now, I'm familiar with New England Patriot tradition. My father took me to Nickerson Field that first day, that night game up there, and the Denver Broncos come in and beat us up. But that tradition began with Crispus Atticus. He would have made a great linebacker. He was going right into the crowd. Now, Myra is surrounded by the revolutionaries and then the contemporaries. But we have some very significant fellows here, Peter Salem and Samuel Poor. A lot of people get them confused. But these fellows both fought in the Battle of Bunker Hill. And what is absolutely incredible and so demoralizing to the British was that Samuel Port killed Major Pitkin of the British Army. And Peter Salem killed in battle Lieutenant Colonel Pitcairn. And the British were so, they had an etiquette about fighting. We were f shooting behind trees and rocks and bushes. These guys were African-American slaves that killed their leaders in battle. And that was the most demoralizing thing. These two men were honored at the State House, unheard of for an African American, but their names were recorded. They were the essence of the beginning of the New England Patriots. Now, beside her, 
I grew up in her cow pasture as Abigail Adams, the wife of our second president, the mother of a president, and um, she stood for the home front. She ran the farm, she did all the work, she milked the cows. She, like Myra Kraft, was the essence of the household. She was the giver, the do-gooder. Her husband was off in business and politics. And they stand together in our hall of heroes as the beginning of our country. Now down below our contemporaries that me and Mr. Hudner were on the executive committee with, I have, a, I have a very exceptional story to share with you folks. I was uh, called to Congressman Moakley's office and he says, I have a very special assignment for you. I have three men that I want you to go and personally invite to my table of honor at Joe Teshi's restaurant for our fundraiser where we raised a couple million dollars. I was in charge of working with 49 state chairmen throughout our country to raise a hundred million dollars to build the National World War II Memorial. I, I want you, Eddie, to go out and invite these fellas to my table of honor at Joe Teshi's. Yes, Joe, whatever you say. So I have the, uh, the duty and the honor to go out and see these three fellas. Now the first guy I go to was out in Andover, Captain George Street. And whenever I tell the story of Captain George Street, I correlate it with a fellow named Bob Kraft. Because though they were in whole different worlds, they did something extraordinary. For all of us that grew up in the Boston area, we loved the Patriots, even though they had some tough years. But we have to be eternally grateful to Bob Kraft for being a very good, astute businessman. And James Orthwine wanted to take this team out of town. And he took a risk, a chance. He was bold and, and creative. And he kept that team here. He, had, he stuck himself out for all of us that live here. Our New England pride, our Patriot pride, was going to go out to St. Louis. And we're eternally thankful for his business acumen and his willingness to stick his neck out and take a risk and make an offer. And thank God he had the business acumen to make them keep them here. Now, how does that correlate to Captain Street? Captain Street was a submarine commander out in the Pacific. And I'm ordered by Joe Moakley to go out and invite him to his table. So I go into his living room. Can you believe a U.S. Naval Annapolis grad sitting in his living room with a button-down sweater and a tie in the afternoon asking me if I want tea with his wife, a little tea set? I can't, I can't get him to stop telling me how grateful he is of me being the volunteer for the memorial committee. I said, Captain Street, I'm here to honor you. You keep honoring me. And he tells me a story about he had to be a little bold. He had to step out and do something because you know what? We had to come up with some gumption and fight back for what the Japanese did in Pearl Harbor. He said, we had to stand up as men and do something. And I said, you know, how in the world did you come up with the idea with just a few torpedoes left to go into that Seiju Harbor in Korea and take out the whole oil terminal, take out the whole fleet of Japanese in the, in the wee hours of the morning, he goes in above the water, all patrol boats around and everything. He hits a frigate, blows it up, hits the oil terminal, blows it up, he blows the whole city up. He's running out of fuel, he's only got a couple of torpedoes, he's taking a risk. He's taking a high leverage risk and they chased him out with the patrol boats. He stayed up above the water to get out fast. He blew them all. He'd made major, major damage in the Pacific on the Japanese fleet. He took a risk for us, for our freedom, and to give it back to those Japanese for killing our 2,000 people in Pearl Harbor. And we're eternally grateful for, for that. Now, I leave his house, and he's committed to be at Joe Moakley's table. And I go home to Plymouth, and I'm relaxing with my kids, and I get up and read the Boston Herald, and Captain Hunter died. Um, Captain Street died. <laughs> Captain Hunter's with us right here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting to Captain Hunter in a minute. Um, so I said, my God, you know, I said, this is, I, I I'm just was with the last people. I called his wife, and she said, you're one of the last people to speak to him. You know, and I was really thinking, about it. it really impacted me, you know, and he's not going to make it to Joe Moakley's table. So I 
go down to Brockton <coughs> Hospital, Brockton VA, because at Braintree, my father's one of his best friends, side of Charlie McGilvery, is at the, I find out is at the VA hospital. And it's the duty nurse, and Charlie's there in the bed, and uh, I said, Charlie, Joe Moakley wants you to be at his table of honor. And uh, he says, nurse, get, have my suit press. <laughs> Order my car from the ancient and honorables. <laughs> yeah, Sullivan's here, and I had just got back from Maine. I, I went up to Maine to Captain Arthur Moore, who wrote the book uh, about the uh, World War II participation of the Merchant Marine, A Careless Word and Needless Sinking. And I had every, every member of my committee at Buzzards Bay, uh, Merchant Marine Veterans, sign that book. And then I drove up to the author of the book, a citizen, a volunteer. The United States government did not write down the highest casualties in World War II with the Merchant Marine, in which nobody knows that Charlie McGilvery was a Merchant Marine. And I had the author of the book, Captain Moore, sign the book, and I said, Captain Moore, Joe Moakley wants you at his table. He says, would you please tell Joe um, I can't make it because I'm busy dying. He wasn't feeling good. So I get out of Boston. I go to Brockton. I meet with Charlie. I have this wonderful, I said, you know, I got this book, and it's signed for you by Captain Moore. So the nurse comes in, takes our picture, and Charlie's missing his left arm. He drops it on the floor. He says, geez, there's so many of those guys died, they had to make the book real big. You know, and I'm going, what a way to look at it, you know? So I, I pick the book up, we get the picture with him and everything, and the nurse, we have a wonderful meeting, and he's saying, you know, he's ordering his uniform to be pressed. He's going to be at the table of honor. And um, it was a, just a wonderful experience, and I'm going out the hall, and she says, you know, you might want to meet this fella down the hall. And I says, oh, well, who's that? And he says, Ernest Wilkins from Randolph. Now, Ernest Wilkins from Randolph gives us a tremendous window into Dory Miller. Every single African American I've ever spoken to, and I've spoken and sailed on ships with an awful lot of African Americans, I have never met an African American or anybody. When I say, do you know Dory Miller, and they just look at me, yeah, I think I do, you know. Dory Miller was a very significant person in World War II. And Ernest Wilkins, his shipmate from Randolph, gave us a wonderful insight. Now, Ernest is in bed curled up in a ball with no teeth, and he's mumbling. And I have a long conversation with Ernest, and they come in and they said, if you want him at the dinner, we're going to order him teeth, and we're going to get him a soup. Now, Ernest ended up making a great speech up at uh, Joe Tesh's. And uh, he, t he gives us a tremendous insight into the fact that their fathers were um, <coughs> slaves. They picked cotton. And they were sitting on the, in the dirt on the side of the road and reading the newspaper that if you went in the Navy, you got three square meals and you get shoes, new shoes. So they joined the Navy. And they ended up in Pearl Harbor. And he's eyewitness. This man was a fullback in Waco, Texas, a star. He could have gone to college. He decided to, he didn't like what happened at Pearl Harbor. You know, he was, he wanted to go in the Navy. So he was there, unfortunately, on the ship when it got attacked. And this is the significance of his entry in the, in the hall. And it all comes back to Myra Craft being a part an, of this great heritage that we have in our country of making great contributions. Because Dory Miller was in the stewards <coughs> department. Because when the ship got attacked in Pearl Harbor, it was illegal for African Americans, people of color, to have arms. It wasn't until after Dory Miller's bravery that that changed with the War Department. They had a cluster problem on their hands at the Pentagon. Because Dory Miller, before he did his bravery, he went up and saved the captain of the ship who was wounded. He carried him to a hospital. Then he came on the ship. Then he grabbed that machine gun, breaking the yeah. Black man wasn't supposed to be shooting the guns. He grabbed that machine gun and he shot down Japanese aircraft. Now, Ernest Wilkins was there. He saw the interview with the War Department. Guess how many planes the African Americans on the ship testified that Dory Miller shot down? Peter, can you pull this? The African Americans reported nine planes shot down. When they interviewed the white sailors on the ship, they said seven. 
he shot down seven aircraft. The War Department gave him the Naval Cross for shooting down two planes. Now that's not the significance. The significance is the law changed. And that's the significance of him being in our Hall of Heroes. And Ernest Wilkins from Randolph gave us that window a better understanding and uh, we're very appreciative of that. We just lost Ernest Wilkins this year in 2011. Now, we're on to Charlie McGilvery, and he was a very unique fellow here in Massachusetts. Charlie McGilvery had come in on a merchant ship as a merchant marine. And I'm talking to him in the hospital, and he's saying, Eddie, don't be calling me a hero. I was scared stiff. When we were coming into Boston Harbor, they shot a torpedo by the stern, and they just missed us. It was the second time my ship was missed, and I had it. All my friends, the, the German U-boats, they were dominating the Atlantic. We were in really bad trouble. They controlled the Atlantic seaboard, and one in seven ships were getting through. And he, was, he told me he was scared. And I said, Charlie, don't tell me that. You know, I've known you my whole life. The Hallorans are here tonight. Major Jim Halloran, the state police, my father, Joe Moakley, and Charlie McGilvery, they all hung out at Joe Moakley's father's pub up in Scully Square. As a little boy, I had to sit in the stool and drink 1,000 Cokes while they were drinking a lot of liquor. And I had to hear all the stories. And now, late in my life, after I have five children, I'm sitting with Charlie McGilvery in the VA hospital. And he's telling me he wasn't brave. He was, you know, he's scared. So he ran as fast as he could down the South Boston waterfront. And he ran in and signed up in the U.S. Army because he wanted to get away from this threat of those German U-boats. And guess where they sent him? His first assignment, the Battle of the Bulge. And Charlie ran up that hill and somehow he got through and not only did he make it up the hill, but they spent weeks going up into the Argonne, way up into France to liberate France. And guess what happens? January 1st, for a whole week they're pinned down in the bottom of the forest, laying in the stomachs in the snow. And this is a guy, you, you would say, what was he like? Well, he had the speed of Wes Walker. <laughs> he had the accuracy in the arm of Tom Brady. He could shoot a gnat 10,000 feet away. At, at, you know, and he was just the most prolific athlete, and he was nimble, and he was tough. And he was second in command. He was sergeant. His lieutenants beside him. They're pinned down for a week. They're freezing to death in the snow. And the Germans are yelling out, if you give up, we're going to give you turkey and a hot blanket. And, you know, all of a sudden a sniper hits the lieutenant, kills the lieutenant. Charlie's in charge. He says, okay, anybody that wants that turkey and the blanket, guess what? I'm going to give you a lead pill in the back of the head because we're not giving up. We didn't come here to give up. We came here to fight. Now, all of you guys are the direct order. You cover me. I'm going up that hill. Charlie McGilvery said, cover me. And with the speed of Wes Walker, he zigzagged behind the trees and up that hill. And Charlie McGilvery, one by one, every machine gun, he jumped, one group, he jumped in the middle of the pit because they were on him. And he shot them, picked up the guy's gun, and shot the rest of them. Charlie McGilvery killed 36 Germans by himself while his whole platoon was laying in the snow. They were ordered to protect him to get up there. He craftily just came boom, 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 boom. The very last German turned around with a machine gun and shot Charlie's left arm off. And thank God he fell into the snow and it froze his arm. They tied him on a Jeep and he made it. He was ordered uh, by James Michael Curley to come into the State House, and they brought him down to President Truman, and they gave him the Congressional Medal of Honor. Charlie McGilvery's in our Hall of <coughs> Heroes because he went beyond the call of duty. Charlie McGilvery was somebody that made great contributions in Boston as a, a, a Treasury agent, and um, he was on our executive committee with Captain Street and Tom Hudner, and I was their field representative. Now, there was one more name in that list. That was Captain Tom Hudner. And I had, I had an appointment with Mr. Hudner. I called him on the phone. But before I did that, I went over to Anthony Athanas and Anthony's PF4, and I said, Anthony, can I use your phone? 
I got to call Joe Moakley. I'm very upset because I just looked in the Boston Herald and Charlie McGilvery died right after I visited him at the Brockton VA. And I said, Joe, he says, what is it, Eddie? I said, listen, don't give me any more slips of paper with guys' names on it. <laughs> he said, what are you talking about? I says, Jesus, I went over and saw Captain Street. I go over, I go down to Brockton VA. I see Charlie. I said, I'm scared to go over and see Captain Hudner. And he says, well, for Christ's sake, he goes, you know what? You're not coming over the house very soon. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> and I said, Joe, um, you don't have any more slips of paper, right? I see. He says, no, okay. Um, and what the wonderful, uh, you know, experience for me is Captain Tom Hudner looking me in the eye at the Old North Church when we're doing an interfaith service for all of our heroes. And Tom Hudner says, you know, Eddie, your pay as a volunteer <coughs> is that you were the one chosen to be the last person to say goodbye to these fellas. And I never thought of it like that. Captain Hudner helped to crystallize it for me. So the reason why we give of ourselves and we come out on cold nights and we honor these great Americans is that it's our duty, they're worthy of it, and you know it gives us a fabric to hold on when we're in tough times. We're in a tough period right now. And I contend to all of you that by memorializing and remember Myra Kraft and what she did is an opportunity for all of us to band together and use that fabric to bring ourselves forward into a more productive society. We're the ones living, we have to go on. And for the Kraft family, you know, for us to, to bring out Myra with all the respect that we can muster because of her great contributions, um, it's a very, very worthy event to bring out her importance in our life because she rewrote the relationship between philanthropy and philanthropists. She was so prolific in giving in charitable works that we may never ever see anybody so prolific in our lives. It would be very difficult for any of us to ever achieve the amount of giving. And when we measured contributions to society, we can clearly say that Mrs. Myra Kraft truly is a national role model for women. Because just that one accomplishment of being the president of the Combined Jewish Philanthropies is a phenomenal accomplishment. And we are very, very thankful, appreciative, and fortunate to have her in the state of Massachusetts. And it's very important for us to leave here tonight with a positive attitude. My job is to instill patriotism in the communities prescribed by Joe Moakley. My job is to say to all of you, no, let's not go home depressed. We've got to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. We know that there's difficult times. We're in one right now. And the example that Myra Kraft gave us is for all of us to come together and help to make our community a better place to be and all of us to be better people. And when, you know, when we measure contributions to so society, she certainly is above and beyond the call of duty. So in saying that, I would like to think that we've highlighted Myra but not leave her alone. To cover, she would want us to talk about other great Americans and put her in the context of being a, a warrior on the home front to, that made contributions that made our life a better place to be here in Massachusetts. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the time you've given. And I realize we have a couple of agenda items. And um, I'd like to confer to you on, I believe from the Secretary, that you have an agenda item on a proclamation. Yes. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Jack Offalette for helping us write a proclamation. I'd like to ask Mr. Sullivan, our clerk, to read that to the community. Thank you, Larry. On behalf of the people of Foxborough, we are proud to join with the Massachusetts National World War II Memorial Committee in honoring the memory of Myra Hyatt Kraft, who in her quiet, unassuming way reached out to the countless thousands of indi individuals in need through her participation in and support of a broad range of charitable endeavors through local, regional, national, and international agencies. Myra came to us in a partnership with her husband, Robert, 
and together with their four sons, Jonathan, Daniel, Josh, and David, have built a legacy that includes not only the le league-leading New England Patriots, but the new Gillette Stadium and the highly acclaimed Patriots plays. So many local and area charities have been welcomed to hold special events there, while others benefit from the support of the New England Patriots Charitable Trust through the donations of tickets, sports memorabilia, or the presence of team celebrities at charitable events, and the organization seeks to raise additional monies to satisfy an even broader range of unmet needs. Individuals working with local Foxborough charitable initiatives have witnessed this time and time again, close and personal. Throughout the tireless efforts, Myra Hyatt Craft has never been satisfied with a single role of facilitator, but rather has been a tireless participant in the actual assessing of needs, embracing and rece recipients, encouraging the volunteers, and striving to assure that most meaningful level of assistance to the most deserving for the benefit of all humankind. Through our lifetime of outreach and caring, Myra has been found to be an individual possessed with the enormous capacity of caring and a passionate inner drive to help make the world a better place for those who have lived and live hope far too long. While striving to fill, fulfill what has become her mission in life, Maya Hyatt Craft has not only helped to make any, many individuals, families, and communities she has also benefited countless organizations while not only assisting but inspiring the volunteers who staff these agencies by reaching out to them with two simple words, asking them to follow me. Myra has left many still laboring in the vineyards of caring for others and her untimely death has made even more determined to continue her legacy. We are very proud to honor her commitment. She is an inspiration to all of us this evening from the Foxborough Board of Selectmen to Robert Craig. acts of kindness and the town of Foxborough selectmen and, and the citizens who are here um, for, for this. Uh, I think Myra would be embarrassed. Um, and, and I think we've taken up too much of your time. I know you have important business. Um, but her life was about acts of kindness and building bridges and doing the work that, and trying to lead by example. I am, I think one of the things she was most proud about was she was the first woman to lead the Boys and Girls Clubs of Boston that had men running it for 110 years. <laughs> so, uh, she uh, taught me a lot of things and I think she taught uh, the Boys and Girls Club a lot of things. <laughs> and they uh, take care of 15,000 young people. The same way the two of us have been embraced by the people of Foxborough, we feel very close to the community here. You welcomed us and have been very kind to us. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more agenda item. If you could please be seated for one moment. Captain Tom Hudner, it's very rare we get him down here. Um, and we would like to, first of all, congratulate Mr. Kraft on a phenomenal season by the New England Patriots. We have one of the greatest coaches, I believe, in the history of football. And Bill Belichick, we can all understand 
would not be down here. He's preparing, working hard, preparing for a big, big game. But we have an, an award Captain Hunter would like to present to you. To, uh, and at the appropriate time, would ask you, Mr. Kraft, to get this to Coach Belichick. But it's a relic from the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. And would like Captain Hunter present it to you and at the appropriate time that you could see fit to get it to the coach. Belichick would appreciate it. We have it here and we'd like to just unveil it. And this is a relic, a 1953 cleats from a special teams player <laughs> down in, in uh, Annapolis. And the award is named after Captain George Street, who me and Captain Hudner served on the executive committee of the World War II committee. And it's, it's called the Thundering Hooves of Annapolis. And the significance of Tom, if you could come with Mr. Kraft, the significance of this trophy is that um, Mr. Belichick and Tom Hudner were Phillips Academy alumni, and they were also U.S. Naval Academy. The, co the coach's father was coach down there. And um, we named it after Captain Street because our duty is to keep these heroes' names in the public eye. And uh, we'd like Captain Hunter presents this to you, Mr. Kraft, to give to Mr. Coach Belichick at the proper time. <laughs> <laughs> from now on. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I just left his office and I will see this, see him tomorrow and present it to him. And I know his dad coached there and he feels very a great fondness. I I thank I thank your group for all the kindness and, thank you, Mr. Kraft. and I think we've taken too much of these people's time. Thank you. Just wait a second, Robert. Just wait. They're gonna. They're gonna. <laughs> Robert, they're gonna leave thank, you. thank you. I, I'm sorry that you're all. I, I know Mara would have been embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any case. Yeah, David. Strike up the band. We're gonna step back. Let these guys lead us out. <laughs> Uh, the board will take a 10 minute recess. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Oh, boy. Okay, now we got to go and do the other thing.